But next, uh, I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, George Sainz. George is the founder and CEO of both Code Combat and Scritter. Code Combat is at the leading edge of the how to code movement, teaching players to code in JavaScript in a video game format, uh, while Scritter teaches the ancient art of Chinese calligraphy using digital age techniques. Hello, everyone. So I was initially going to start this talk off by just telling you that I want you all to learn a little bit of programming. But uh, we can get into that in a moment. Well, I guess what would be perhaps most helpful is telling you a little bit about how I got started doing companies and building them. Because it wasn't so long ago, at least it feels like that for me, that I was uh, attending talks and like reading Paul Graham essays and participating in entrepreneurship kind of as a a spectator. Um, started my, as, as Mark mentioned, I've been in, I've founded two companies now, and I started without a technical background. No one even told me what computer programming was until I was about 20 years old. And you might think that that sounds kind of wild, but growing up in rural Ohio and the son of, of two non-technical parents, you don't hear about computer programming. I got my first computer when I was much older than anyone I can see here in the in the audience. Uh, all, all the kids here, you guys are much younger than I was when I got my first computer. And so you you can imagine like you're sitting around in rural Ohio and you know you you bought this Windows computer that your dad got from California and you're playing your video games. And it was a huge revelation when, in sophomore year of, my, of college, someone actually, you know, taught me that there was a way to program the computers in a way to make the experience more personal. As in, like, someone somewhere was actually putting characters into a computer, and my games were coming. And this was a huge revelation. Um, and it was shortly thereafter that um, that that I started my first my first company and realized just how important it was to understand programming. So that's, I mean, that, that was actually a little bit of what I wanted to you know, start off with here, but no, no, come on. There we go. Okay. So the, oh, yeah, that's me. I've lost a little weight. Um, so the, the two companies that I've done so far are all in education. And uh, the first one was teaching Chinese characters. If anyone here has learned Chinese or Japanese, um, we did. We taught the writing portion, but what I'm most interested in today is about programming, and I really think that everyone in the audience, whether you're 10 years old or whether you're 50 years old, should learn a little bit of programming, and you should do it as soon as you can, because programming there's there's a lot of hype. If you if you listen to people in the learn to code movement, of which I guess I am a part now, um, there's a lot of hype that suggests that, oh, if you learn programming, you know, your life is going to change and you're going to have five Ferraris and you're going to live on the moon or something. Um, I don't think it's that drastic, but I do think it's imperative. And I'm going to go through kind of the, the primary reason, oh, I'll back up one moment, the primary reason is that creators are going to prosper. And they're going to prosper disproportionately in the future because the more technology we have available at our fingertips, the more you can leverage your ability to create stuff. So that mobile phone in your in your pocket is, as um, we were just talking about, becoming the driver of productivity. So if you can learn to create, and the things that you can create on are increasingly integrated with the world, and we have this Internet of Things, 99% of things aren't, aren't uh, connected right now, but they are going to be. Um, if you can program that, you're going to become sort of like a wizard, um, because you'll be able to type things into a computer terminal and things in the real world will happen. My co-founder's dad is the open source leader of a, of a software package called Mr. House that can do things like open the windows and turn on the thermostat and open your doors and turn off the lights. And it's almost a little creepy how incredible his ability to control his world is. So creators prosper. 
And in the 21st century, programming skills are the ultimate creative ability. But a lot of adults won't tell you to program. And I'm going to go through three reasons why they, they won't. And I'm going to try and debunk them for you so that you know how important the skill is. Um, what they're going to tell you, th these are the three things. <laughs> So, you know, kind of paradoxically, the learn to code movement is all about, oh, let's teach the kids to code. But uh, kind of in our enthusiasm, most sensible adults have realized, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you know, actually programming is really tough. And unlike the zealots out there, they're, they're, it's actually really hard to learn to program. And it takes time. It's not something you can do in a weekend. You can create something small in a weekend, something meaningful. But you won't be learning the hard skills that are required to create the next thing. So one argument is that if you're not going to do it full time, well, why the heck do it at all? Like, you know, let's, let's, let's teach people that are, you know, let's teach them something a little bit more fuzzy, a little bit logical thinking or computational literacy, whatever you want to call it, um, because you're not going to be a full time programmer. So don't worry about it. The next thing they're going to tell you is that um, learning to program isn't for you specifically. And this is sort of a controversial point, and I, I'm really happy that people are, are addressing it more. When I was learning to code, people would look at me and they'd say, oh, well, that kid can code um, because he is a certain kind of person. He's this white, nerdy dude. And I was. I still am. But that's really toxic to the environment around this skill. And I really, it's it's extraordinarily important that people understand that just because you're not a part of this little tiny niche, you don't look and behave like Mark Zuckerberg, you can't do it. It's absolute rubbish. And then the, you know, there's this idea that perhaps math and science are programming. I'm going to debunk these one by one. So I call these kind of the myth of commitment, i.e. if you're not going to do it full time, don't do it at all. Uh, the myth of identity, that if you're not, if you don't look and act like a certain kind of person, uh, you can't do it. And then the myth of utility, which is that if you perhaps learn math or science, um, they have the same utility as learning to program. So let's start with the first one. Um, this is sort of the logic that takes you through why, if you're not going to be a full-time programmer, you shouldn't learn to program. So I agree with the first two statements, which are that learning to program is really hard. And that there are dozens of skills that every, every kid should learn. I've learned to play a musical instrument. I learned calculus. I learned about the history of the United States and other countries in the world. These are all valuable things to have learned. But there is, <laughs> if you're going to teach something else, it is sort of going to replace something that's existing in our curriculum. And this is really tough. It's very controversial because the things that we teach our children are a reflection of our society. And it's very tough to go in and tell someone like, oh, you know, actually, American history, that's less important than programming. I'm not going to say that in this talk, but I do think programming is more important than a lot of the things I learned in middle school <laughs> and high school. Um, and so you take these two arguments together and you say, oh, well, I guess we shouldn't teach kids to be going to do, to do programming unless they're going to be full-time software engineers. And I think that's wrong. So I'm going to give you three real quick real world examples of times in my life and those around me that we really could have learned to program. Like it really would have been beneficial. So the first was when I had my first uh, kind of like official summer internship between freshman and sophomore years of college. Um, I was, you're going to find, it's going to be kind of silly, but I was hired for $8 an hour to click on links that my employer had auto generated with a script and check a box if the link was still good. I did that for eight weeks. Eight weeks, eight hours a day, I just clicked links, and if it was a 404, I unchecked a box. Now, you think about that for a moment. You're like, wait a minute. Is that really a productive use of someone's time? The answer is no. No, it isn't. It was silly. If my programmer, if my, if my boss had sat down and said, you know, we have this task. We need to check this list of 17,000 links to see whether or not all of them are good. But instead of teaching you how to uncheck a box because you're a dumb humanities major and I can't teach you anything, which is sort of what he, what he told me, um, I'm going to teach you a little bit of Python scripting, and we're going to do this in like a week. That would have been a lot better use of his money and my time. 
So my mother is really interested in um, a historical reenactment. It's sort of like cosplay for adults. And um, in particular, she's interested in 18th century bonnets. Now, you might not think there's a lot to know about bonnets, but let me tell you, there is. And she wants to keep a database of all of the different sewing styles for all the different bonnet types and wants to run pivot queries against that database. Now, she's not a software engineer, but I guarantee you that she spends more time per year curating an Excel spreadsheet with all this data in it than it would take her to learn a little bit of SQL and run queries against it. And finally, my brother, um, which I'm going to talk briefly about in a, little, in a few minutes, um, got his first job and his employer asked him to query data across these gigantic Excel documents and he didn't know how to do it. And so for many, many months, he spent hours and hours every day running manual queries to find data for his boss. Now these are all, like, if you know programming, if you've learned CS, uh, computer science, you'll know that these are all rudimentary examples that we, I could have been taught to do this in a week, maybe. Instead, I, uh, you know, I spent the rest of the summer. So, this is um, a prime examples of where programming could have been extraordinarily useful. And as a result, I think, I hope it made this point that you can really use programming um, even if you're not going to be a full-time programmer. So then we get to this, this kind of pervasive myth that you have to be a certain kind of person. And I want to tell you about a, a girl that I knew in college. Her name was Elizabeth. We were taking computer science 101 together. And uh, Elizabeth was, I didn't know her well, but she and I were in the class. There were perhaps 20 people in this class, two of which were women. The rest of us were kind of your oh, uh, white nerdy men. Um, in particular, there was one guy, I'm going to refer to him as Linux guy, even though, I, I, you know, we're not going to name him by name. But Linux guy was really obnoxious. He was the sort of, guy, the sort of kid that would like introduce the, or um, interrupt the professor while they were teaching and, and just show off how much he knew. He brought this huge computer to class and wouldn't use the, the, compu the school's computers because he thought he knew better. Um, but most importantly, he created a sort of a toxic environment because he turned our computer science labs into sort of like a guy's like locker room of humor. So we, we were kind of in the middle of the semester. I was struggling, was, as I mentioned, computer science is very hard. And Elizabeth was sort of breezing through these classes. I mean, she was, she was doing it probably like twice as fast and twice as good as me. And I would sometimes come over and be like, hey, Elizabeth, how do I do this thing? And she was, she was always on top of it. But Linux guy was this pervasive like, force in, in our class. So uh, we got to the end of the class. Um, I, you know, I, I scraped by. Elizabeth flew by. Um, and I didn't, we, you know, I didn't see her for a while. And then um, at the time, she was a computer science major. Two years later, I saw her, I was a junior at that point, um, and I saw her in the quad and I said, oh, you know, how's it going? And she said that, I, I asked how her computer science major was going, and she said that she changed from computer science to uh, gender and women's studies. Because, and, I, and I said, well, that makes no sense. Like, I was in class with you. You were like twice as good as everyone else, and you clearly enjoyed it. What happened? And she said she didn't feel welcome, that it just didn't seem like her kind of thing. And I thought back, and I, I, it was just, you know, makes you really angry. I've, I felt, wow. Now, I, I, she didn't say Linux guy was the reason. But I looked back, and I thought, wow, I can easily see how that sort of environment wouldn't have been comfortable for me if it had been inverted. I, I can see why some people get the idea that this is not their field. This, they're not comfortable here. And this is a huge problem. Because as we were just talking about, if 99% of things in our world are going to be connected by this, by programming, by computers. And we're deciding, as a society, that the 0.01% of our society gets to decide what those things do. Is that sensible? I hope that we can all agree not. We need more people with more perspectives to come in and create things. So, you don't have to be a nerdy guy like me to create stuff, and I certainly hope that people in our field are communicating that to young people. Then there's a third, and this is kind of, this is more, um, per perhaps a little more academic, but I don't think 
I think that STEM skills are very valuable. I mean, obviously, you need to know a little bit of math. You know a little bit of science to be kind of a productive member, um, and especially if you're going to be creating things. But there is this idea that if you learn math and science, that they are equally useful to programming. And I just wanted to uh, kind of refute this very briefly. So my what the experience that I've had and that my brother has had, my brother is several years younger and has had, I mean, he's been out of college for less time. Uh, it, the industry wants engineers, not necessarily scientists. And two short stories. My brother graduated with a degree in, in physics. And while he was in his senior year, he called me up. I'd been out of school for two years. And he said, George, you know, I've got a little bit of time in my schedule. What should I take? And I said, oh my gosh, Alex, learn, learn programming. Just like, stop, just learn programming, seriously. And he said, oh, okay, all right, right, and he didn't do it. Um, so he fast forward one year, and he's been unemployed for three months, and he's living in my parents' basement, I, literally in the basement. And you know, I'm calling him, we're having our weekly like chat, and he says, wow, George, you know, everyone just wants programmers. <laughs> and I, I didn't say I told him so, but shortly thereafter, he learned VBR scripting and got his first job. Another one of my friends who I graduated with, uh, and again, a physics major, spent five years. He, he just last week finally made the transition at Google to being a software engineer. The point is that both of these guys, both my brother and my good friend, really sharp at math, really sharp at um, their respective fields, but they had trouble finding work because what people want are engineers, and what they want is programming. So you don't have to be a full-time engineer, you don't have to be a certain kind of person, and programming is different than science. So how do you do it exactly? That's a good question. I would tell you to go out and build things that matter to you because ultimately that will be the driving force behind your learning. So what matters to you? Well, I had another friend, uh, his name is Ben. He built a politics website in college, politics major, and he's now the uh, senior uh, web developer for the Huffington Post. A friend of mine was really interested in retro games, kind of a weird guy, and built a, uh, an RPG, a top-down RPG in um, Visual Basic. You, I mean, I can't tell you what's important to you. But I can tell you that if you know, if you can think of something that you want to see in the world, that's the direction you should be going. Then you need to find a mentor because getting stuck is frustrating and causes you to lose motivation. So find something you want to build, find someone that can help you build that thing and go to it. And then uh, if you're interested, you can talk to me. I'd be happy to tell you. There are like literally hundreds of websites and services and groups that are, com that are kind of being created to help people learn these skills. And I'd be happy to, to help you out. I blog and tweet all the time about stuff like this. If you follow Code Combat, you, you're gonna get that. If you're new to programming, play Code Combat. It's intended for beginners. And then Google it because that's how real programmers do it. So thank you very much. Learn a little programming. I appreciate your time.